Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the How Did You Learn to Do That podcast. Today, we have a very special episode. I have a panel here uh, to talk about what being a woman of color is like and their experiences in starting in their industries and the work that they do every day and the different challenges and successes and wins that they experience and how they're able to navigate that. So I'd like to welcome and introduce Alicia, Rachel, and Gabby to the podcast today. I'll have them actually do a short introduction. They were all on um, the podcast over this last month. They were individual episodes for each of them. So you, you can go back to those episodes to hear, uh, hear them out and hear more about their story and what they do. Uh, but I'll start with Alicia. If you'd like to just introduce yourself, who you are, what you, what you do, um, and your businesses. Yeah, of course. So I'm Alicia. I am the founder of The Social Project, which is a social media and digital marketing agency. We work with brands all over the globe, helping them with intentional marketing campaigns that yield results. Um, social media is my jam. I love it. So no one ever, right? Um, <laughs> but yes, bring me all the algorithms, everything. I'm here for it. So that is what I do. Um, and I am also the co-founder of a women's entrepreneurial group out in Seattle called Seattle Business Babes with um, Danielle Weeb, who is founder of Business Babes Collective. Awesome. I think that's Thank it. you. <laughs> and I should actually mention that uh, we, we, we all met through the Action Takers Club with the, with the Business Babes Collective and both Rachel and Alicia were, were uh, instructors in that course and, and Gabby and I took that together. So, so we were all connected that way. Uh, so Rachel, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course. Thank you for having us. So my name's Rachel Magpayo slash Valenteros. I'm going by my full last name now. I typically just go by one or the other. It's really long. Um, I am a mompreneur, a work at home mompreneur. I recently just got a studio that we're moving into, but I still will be a I guess, work at Studio Mom. <laughs> My kids will still be going with me there. <laughs> and I own a tropical and coastal shop as well as a creative studio, both with a sustainable mindset. And like Alicia, I am the chapter leader for San Diego Business Babes, which is what you said, how we all met. So that's yeah, pretty much awesome. my job. <laughs> awesome, I'm excited to have you both here. And Gabby, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Um, so as Antiza said, my name is Gabby, or I go by Gabriella on my social media handle. I am the founder of two different platforms. Uh, one uh, titled Charlas, where um, it's really advocating and support, supporting the Hispanic community, um, specifically in Canada and the US, but we also like to connect with uh, Latinos all over the globe. Um, and then also the founder of Audacious, uh, which is a platform where I advocate on taboo topics. And so we look at mental health, uh, abuse, and then just overall, uh, just reowning and uh, sharing your stories and really creating a safe space for people. Um, and so on, on the side of that, I'm a outreach worker as well. And so that's really where my love for community has come from. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Excited to have you all here. Um, so I, so as the nature of the podcast, and I mentioned this earlier before we started recording, but it's open. So what I'll do is I'll um, just frame it around a couple questions, but feel free to jump in um, as you wish. Um, and then I'll just call upon one of you, I guess, to start and then feel free to jump in and share your perspective and um, any comments or questions that you might have. And if you have your own questions, feel free to pose those as well um, to challenge us to think deeper and think further. So my first question that uh, will kick off the panel today is when you were getting into the industries that you're in and into the work that you're doing, what was your notion of success? What did you see when you started looking around in your industries? Um, for success and who do, who looked, um, who were you looking at for that? And what did you see in those industries? Everybody in my industry looked very white. Um, I remember going to, but everybody looked white. And so I remember going to a marketing conference, which I go to every year. And, um, everyone was like, everyone was in suits first off. And I was there in like leather pants and a jean jacket and pink <laughs> sneakers. Um, 
and everybody was a white male. Like I didn't see another Indian agency owner. So help me God. And it was almost discouraging, but at the same time, it, um, was, it almost fueled the fire, fire of me being like, okay, how do I disrupt this? How do I make more space for other women who might not look like these guys, probably mm-hmm. don't look like these guys, um, and don't look like the Jenna Kutchers or, you know, Rachel Hollis's of the world. How do I bring them to the table? How do I create space for them? So that's kind of where, yeah, that's the influence I saw around in the marketing industry, at least. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's so true. And I love that you said that it ignited your fire um, and motivated you to disrupt that market. And I think that's awesome. Um, Gabby, did you want to share your experience? Of course. So as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, um, all of my, uh, I guess, passion and outreach work came from my actual nine to five job. Um, And that's really where everything stemmed from, right? Just uh, facilitating uh, different community projects in whether it was in the in the actual like recreational centers or like schools. And I was realizing that a lot of the things that were happening were common topics that were being uh, shared with the kids or youth was just like, well, you know, in, in working with inner city uh, neighborhoods, right? And a lot of them would say to me, well, Gabby, you know, there's like, why would I do that? Like, that's not true. Uh, people like us, uh, you know, just throwing all these labels and stereotypes uh, saying, you know, there's no one that really is doing something like that, that looks like me or sounds like me or that they could really relate to, right? And so being the outreach worker that I was, that really hit home. I was like, oh my gosh, this is not okay if these kids are feeling this way, right? So. I'm like, what can I do? How can I, you know, bring in people that they can connect with, people that they could relate with? And so, what I started doing in uh, some of my after-school programs uh, last year, I actually uh, organized their entrepreneurship uh, after-school program. So, what I did is I invited different, um, like, local leaders, uh, just people who could wanted to come out and speak to these uh, children and youth, and that's how everything just really stemmed. And it was amazing. And in short, um, in also looking for, you know, community leaders or people who could come in and connect with these children and youth, I realized that there was a lack of, right? And then that's where, you know, everything just connected for me. And it was like, okay, so clearly, you know, what I'm doing here, I, it's time, or I just felt that it was time for me to take it one step further and also do it outside of work rather than what I was yeah. doing with the children and youth. And I mean, I'm like, all right, let's do this. And that's actually how Charla's uh, stemmed. And just the whole representation component of it is, is so important for me. But I definitely understand this whole uh, topic that I'm really excited about. And I'll probably be mentioning it over and over again. But I just see the importance, you know, even be, of us being here is, is really cool. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, and I I totally resonate with you when you say that there is when you're looking for, you know, speakers, or, um, or people to represent um, a conversation that you want to have that it becomes a bit of a a challenge, you know, to to find and, um, and there's not a lot of people sharing their voices. in a, in a forum like this or in, in, in front of students or um, professionals to ex- share their experiences. And I know that over the last um, year and definitely the last two years, there's been a shift and there's definitely a lot more people wanting to share their voice. There's a lot more space for that now, um, but we'll see, we'll see how it moves forward. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Rachel, did you wanna share your experience? Of course. So my notion for success when I first started, it wasn't really there. I had zero standards because how I started was um, I was a hoarder and I just collected a bunch of stuff over the past couple of decades from like all the wooden things, things from my parents and my grandparents. And my grandparents are both from Hawaii and from the Philippines. So those are the things that I just had a lot of laying around. And I remember watching an episode of Fixer Upper. At that time, I was blogging. So all I did was blog, and I didn't understand, um, like, pay-per-clicks or ads or anything for blogs. So I was just giving away information for free. It was just an outlet, and I was starting to get burnt out. And I go, okay, I'm pregnant. I'm about to have a second kid, and I can't keep going at this rate. Because here I am stressing about posting the seven 
swim holes of the world to visit. <laughs> and I'm like, I told people I have this live at 8 a.m. and I'm doing it all night. I'm like, no one cares about swim holes at 8 a.m. And I'm just stressing myself out. And so I remember just having a meltdown. And the next day I'm watching Fixer Upper with my one-year-old. And there's this one episode where Joanna Gaines uses this door that she's been hoarding for eight years. And she was like, I know I would finally use that. And Chip's like, yeah, good thing you're a hoarder because now we could use that for a project. And then I thought to myself, hey, I'm a hoarder. I could do something with this. <laughs> so um, from that day, I, within four days, I got my business license. I converted my blog, my travel and destination blog to an online tropical and coastal shop, gave my followers a whirlwind. They're like, what's happening? <laughs> what's going on? And within two weeks, I found out that I made zero sales. And at that time, I had a good amount of followers on Instagram because I was giving away free information. But once I started selling stuff, people were just dropping off like flies. And because there's no leeway. So having someone like Alicia in your corner with the launches and social media, you need to know her because I can tell you that I had zero standards for success. So I didn't even know what I was doing. I just knew I needed to do something creative. And so I signed up for a market, just a local vintage flea market that I found while browsing around. Thank goodness for Instagram algorithm. I guess they saw me looking at all of the vintage stuff and they said, hey, there's a market coming up look at this. And I looked at it. I signed up for it. And I found out that day that I can make a profit from selling used items that I no longer need. So at that day, I considered it all profit because I was just hoarding. I made $2,200 in that one day. Wow. And I was like, okay, this is something. <laughs> like I feel a lot lighter. So I guess I didn't really have a standard for success, but I considered that successful. And from then on, as long as I could pay for like my own things, pay for my business, get a profit off the end of the day and pay for my student loans, that's what I considered successful. So yeah, it kept going up after that. I'm like, okay, I now I have two kids. My time away from them is worth more and more. But that's what my notion was when I first started. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's awesome that you you killed that market. You did so well, <laughs> and you and I love that you you were watching the fixture upper and you're and you just you know thought to yourself that that's something you could do and that you you know have um, have those items as well. And I know um, it's funny that you say that because I actually uh, my sister's very much like that. Like she'll she'll hoard a lot of things and she hoards it because she thinks it's going to be worth something in the future. But I have to tell her to. To follow you and to connect with you so that uh, she can, you know, be inspired by what you've done. I think that's awesome. And I, um, I really love everything that you you've all shared about your industries. And I know for me, you know, being a rather newer um, online entrepreneur and just having started in April, when I first started like you, Rachel, I had no standards. I didn't know what a brand was um, until Action Takes Takers Club. And I was like, oh, everything is supposed to look the same. <laughs> You know, I didn't know any of that. I just knew that you created an Instagram account and, you know, Alicia's probably gonna, um, not, <laughs> not like this. So if those of you listening, um, make sure you get in, uh, follow Alicia. She's, I know you, well, by the time this airs, actually your course will already have launched, but she has a great course coming out for anyone that wants to know how to, how to do anything on Instagram. Uh, but I know when I started, I just was like, okay, I'm just going to post a couple of pretty pictures. I'm just going to, you know, kind of have one sentence captions because I was living in, you know, 2012. And I was like, you know, that's going to be good enough for me and I'll do well. And then I got started and then I realized that that world was so different. But the biggest thing I noticed was I was getting bombarded with um, all these people that were kind of doing the same similar kind of coaching stuff that I was doing. And I guess just having coaching or self-development on my uh, profile made the algorithm, you know, funnel people towards me. And I remember looking at all the accounts and nobody looked like me. You know, there was, there was very, I actually don't think there was any women of color on all, any of these accounts that the algorithm was funneling over to me. Um, and I kept looking at how, you know, how much success they had. And I kept looking at everything that they did and I remember having this conversation and this is kind of leads to our next question 
having a conversation with my dad about what, what I wanted to do with this online world. And he said to me, and you know, my dad's dream my whole life was for me to be a doctor. And that's, I feel like every immigrant parents wish, right? It'd be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. These are the three things we're <laughs> encouraged to do. And I remember at the time when I was um, in pre-med, I said to my dad, I don't want to go to med school. I'll do public health. And he didn't know what I do. Right. And he's like, I don't, he still to this day does not understand what I do at all. And um, now he actually thinks I just help people not get COVID. <laughs> but he doesn't actually fully get it. But when I explained this to him, he said to me, he's like, what are you doing? He's like, you know, as a, as a woman, um, as an immigrant, you, you know, you work for the government, you got your master's degree, isn't that good enough? Like, what else do you want? Like, People like us don't go on online and create a business. We don't do these kinds of things. And I and I kind of had to question him, like, what do you mean people like us and do this and that? And he he was coming from more of like a risk perspective, right? He's like, what's the risk in here if this doesn't work out for you? What are you going to lose? You're going to lose all this thing that you've, you know, put so much energy in. There's so many people that can't can't want to get to where you're at and they're not. And that really got me thinking that, you know, what messages do we hear from our parents and our grandparents um, growing up and then how do we actually make a shift in that messaging for ourselves and the generations ahead of us so have any of you had those kinds of experiences and have made a conscious decision to not um, speak to yourself that way and not continue that messaging down the line yeah we can start with Rachel so to this day my dad, of course, I didn't live up to the doctor dream. So he talks to my son <laughs> and saying, are you going to be a doctor when you grow up? If you're going to be a doctor, I'll buy you a BMW. I was like, seriously, dad, he's one. <laughs> like, I don't even know if he know He barely learned his alphabet. BMW, you're teaching him the wrong alphabet. <laughs> so my, and my oldest, my four-year-old, he wants to be a firefighter. And my dad goes, if you're a doctor first, <laughs> and then he'll just say something that's off the wall. But that's just ingrained in our culture. And my, my parents are not your stereotypical, like they're both born in the Philippines. So they're not your stereotypical Filipino where my mom's not a nurse and my father's not in the military. They um, were both big supporters for their siblings. So they chose the most cost efficient major at their college, their college sweethearts and both accounting. So my father's a CPA my mother was accountant. And, um, so nursing and I married into military and my brother married a nurse. So we're like, okay, we kind of got your standards, but no, they'll still talk about medical. They really want to the same. My parents still want me to go to nursing school. And so, um, and to them, it's more so, um, oh, you get to not Google all the illnesses your kids have. You actually know what's going on with your kids. <laughs> And then it's working three days a week. They're like, and then you could still support your own business. But my parents have been very supportive of my creative side. So mm -hmm. that being said, as much as they egged and tried and tried and tried to get me into the medical field, at the end of the day, they still paid for my college when it came to getting my fashion design degree. And my wife had co-business was based off of my parents and my grandparents and Toto Tess, which is a creative studio, are my parents' nicknames. So they're oh. big supporters, even though they still want me to be a nurse. <laughs> yeah. 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 They have, that's like the way they feel like they're being good parents. It's like, I'm a good parent if I just keep telling you to be a nurse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. It's just, it's, it's interesting how, but you know, that's kind of the messaging that they were probably given growing up and they just feel like that's what they need to do in order to be good parents in their eyes and what that means to them. But yeah, I still, I still get that question all the time. Like, are you, are you, are you still going to go to med school? And you know, I'm like, dad, no, like that's over for me, <laughs> you know? So uh, Gabby, do you want to share, have you ever had those kinds of experiences and how do you actually, um, have you made a conscious effort to not um, share that kind of messaging with yourself? Yeah, so definitely. I mean, I think uh, for a lot of us, uh, first generation or immigrant uh, children, I feel that we get a lot of those stressors from our family. Um, there's a lot of the new generation, at least because I am connected with the Hispanic community now. A lot of the messages or common themes that I've heard is like, 
you know, our, our parents had to survive upon when they immigrated to these countries. And then for us now it's all about thriving, but it's that transition and sharing that message with our parents, with uh, the older generation as well for them to understand, right? Where for them, it's just like the cookie cutter, like careers and so, yeah, I mean, my mom's dream was for me to become a nurse or be work in the medical field. Always. That was like the one way to get to success, you know, work in the medical field, become a nurse or become a doctor or something. And you, that's success. Right. Um, but it's it's funny because like for me, it was the opposite. Um, I, I was always more of a creative. And that's like another backstory that I have. But I, I always felt there was so much pressure because I, I had to pursue all these other different uh I guess, areas of study that I, that were interesting, but I really wasn't passionate about it. Right. And so just really sharing that transition, um, with others. And it's, I feel like I've always been in some form, like a pioneer in sharing that message. Right. And so definitely that's a message that I, I love sharing with, whether it's with like the kids at work or like my peers or people who are from my community, just be like, you know, it's all about pursuing what you love, um, you know, and yeah, you know, some, some of the consequences that you're going to see is that some, our parents are not going to always understand, or, you know, how you, you ladies express, like your, our parents may not understand what we're doing. Right. Or it's like, Oh, like, why are you online? Are you making any money? Like, what's the whole point of this? And so they're concerned, like, what are you going to do in your future? Like the pension, the pension is huge. Yeah. right? <laughs> and so it's like, you know, just, just being respectful and in hearing our parent, our parents, in my case, just like my mom, right. Right? And it's like, you know, I hear you and, and I'm always trying to explain to my mom, like things have changed, right? It's yeah. a whole other new generation success. It looks differently. It's not just one way. And just, I'm always, always trying to reiterate that with whether it's with my mom or any other adults, because I know it's tricky. It's tricky. It's not easy right? Because you know, sometimes you can may find yourself alone. I have found myself alone in that, in that pathway as well, as you know, you mentioned being a, a woman of color and it's like, but there aren't a lot of females in our community who, who, you know, go out and do these things, but you know, at the same time, that's not necessarily true. And so that's another message that I want to, you know, share a little bit later, but it's just really cool. Like, look at us, you know, we're all women of color and we're here. Right. So clearly we all have our stories in terms of the struggle that we've had to go through or just like breaking those labels, stereotypes. But at the same time, it's kind of like we're joining that new wave of uh, the generation yeah. that's changing that for everyone behind us. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that you talked about the pension, too, because that I feel like that is a conversation I have with also my dad weekly you know and he's a, it's funny because he's an entrepreneur he has his own business you know and he said he would never you know from the day he stepped foot in Canada he said he would always have his own business and he worked hard for that right and my mom too and um and but he tells me like you know you got to stick with the pension you need a pension you need it and I was like dad by the time the baby boomers take all the money and the pension there's nothing left for me you know, so, so I got to make my own pension, but yeah, I, I completely resonate with you that it's true that, yeah, there is, um, as Alicia said, it, there is like, you know, the Jenna Kutcher's, the Mary Forleo's, the, the big names and the Rachel Hollis and the big names that you see out there that you're like, oh my gosh, like, you know, those, that's the kind of, you know, like, you know, the picture of success you may think like from an online perspective, right? But then there's definitely, like you said, a lot of, women of color coming up now and you know that are really sharing their voice and really sharing their perspective and um and making a true change and that th that representation is there and it's coming yeah I think that's awesome um Alicia do you I feel like you have a, a, a great story to share <laughs> of course um kind of going off of what Gabby was saying is our parents idea of success looks very different than ours um, so trying to maneuver around that, I'm sorry, I first, by the way, I'm saying, um, but trying to maneuver around that and figuring out, okay, how do I have them understand exactly what I love doing? And also mixing that into 
hey, you can actually make a living doing this now um, because we're in a different age and we have, you know, different tools available to us is so important. Um, so there's definitely that part of it, which has been, I'm going to say on my end, um, easy, kind of. Um, I did start off going into dentistry because my entire family are either dentists, lawyers, or once again, engineers or doctors, um, <laughs> majority being dentists. And um, yeah, it was like the only thing that I really saw kind of growing up because, you know, my aunts and my cousins, that's what they were doing. And I was like, cool, this is amazing. Like they're super successful. So I saw that and yeah, I got out of high school, started doing that. Also taking into consideration that I am part of like the model minority as well. So, you know, going after that, um, it's the Asian community who are like, okay, we have to be disciplined in everything we do. And, you know, the way of life is very, very similar between um, many of us and all that stuff. Um, along with, there is a saying in, um, I'm going to say Hindi because that's what we speak. And they, it pretty much translates into what are people going to say? So um, yeah, look, yeah, dig it. It's yeah. So what are people going to say? Like, if you do that, what are, you know, what are family yeah. members going to say? They're going to see you going off the rails and like starting your own business business, whatever that means. And so that was a huge part of it in the beginning as well, is if you don't go this route, then what are people going to say? Like, what are they going to say about how we raised you? And like, that's a reflection on us and whatnot. And I mean, it obviously looks very, very different now because they're like super excited when I have like a podcast recording or like I'm on a panel on a stage. They're like, yeah, like that's my daughter. But in the beginning, they had no idea like what they were even getting themselves into when I was like, Hey, I want to start my own business. They were like, mm, actually, you're just, you're just going to go through with law school. Like, no, what are you talking about? Um, so yeah, I think that was a big thing is, Oh, like, what are people going to say? Yeah. And it's huge in the Indian community. Oh, it's huge in my community too. What people are going to say is huge. It's like, it's at the forefront, but I feel like, um, I still got that even though my parents, because my parents are divorced. Right. So they're the very first people like in our family and in our community that were divorced and I think that they got through that what are people gonna say because they got divorced so my sister and I kind of like with our parents we like kind of like slid under the radar because they were too focused on their divorce to worry about what people were going to say about us but um I know my mom my dad is more much more traditional my mom is less and she was totally like you know, who cares what people are going to say, do whatever you want, um, you know, just make, just do something that makes you happy. And I think that that was kind of the driving motivation from her. Um, yeah, and I think that, um, yeah, I think that the biggest motivation, like you said, what are people going to say um, for me? And I always had that in the back of my mind was that, um, you know, for me, it was opposite. It was because my family, we fled Afghanistan as refugees, like we fled overnight, like it's one of those crazy stories, like, two of my uncles and two of their cousins were kidnapped and taken to be child soldiers and overnight they like literally ran out away through the mountains walked for like four or five days into Pakistan from Afghanistan and uh, called their parents and was like yeah this is what's happened we can't ever come back because they'll kill us and uh and then yeah overnight my family packed up we paid a human smuggler and like crossed the border and a year later we were in Canada and so I remember from a young age, my mom saying to me, like, what are people going to take think if you had this second opportunity and you didn't make it work? Like you didn't do, you didn't achieve your dreams. You didn't chase whatever made you happy. Like, what would people think of that? You know, and especially because my uncle in Canada who sponsored us, he would always drive that home because he had been here like right, 40, 40, 50 years. Um, he would try to like instill that uh, notion into us about you know living a full life while you're in Canada and you have this opportunity and you know all these different things that are at your footsteps basically and in your hands you can do um so for me it was that perspective which um which why I which is why I always think that as as immigrants um there's just so much that we take um that we don't take for granted there's so much that we appreciate um and it's because we hear those stories and those experiences from our, our families um a lot yeah and Rachel were you about to say something sorry I, no don't apologize thank you for sharing that with us um, strong family <laughs> super strong family so I was just going to piggyback what Alicia was saying in regards to um, 
our family and other people like what are yeah what other people are going to say what you were saying as well Angeza. so i grew up in a really conservative christian like church and going into fashion design which is what i went to after high school and i became a fashion designer and when i would go back people would say like don't you feel like you're being too worldly like you're not helping anybody and my parents were the ones who always told me don't mind them you're making people feel better <laughs> like and i also like do they know that i also did a lot of charity work also and so um my parents always put in my head like perception versus reality people's perception is not your reality like as long as you know you're doing something good and you're being a better person and you're bringing more good into the world and your intentions are in a good place um, as long as you're continuing to pray and all of those things don't mind what other people say and i think if i didn't have parents who told me that i would be crying in a corner every day because having that support system even if you finally fight for that support system, my father wasn't like super into it, but he still supported me financially. Like we actually didn't talk growing up. My dad was always working when he decided to pay for my college and um, he cornered me at home and he goes, I think we need to start talking because I'm paying for your college. And I was like, okay, hi dad. <laughs> it's like, we never had a relationship before that. So um, exactly to your point of what would people say, a lot of the things I get are from people of the same ethnicity who are not my parents. It's like um, family members, a bunch of like friends, community, people who want me to do something different. Some people say you should be working in corporate. You shouldn't be launching your own business. Some people say you should still focus on being a stay at home mom. You shouldn't even be focused on work right now because you have two young kids. Luckily, my parents weren't that. And that is, I think, where I derive the strength from because you hear a lot of the cultural happening from everywhere else. And it's just a lot of noise. So just to yeah. piggyback what you ladies are saying. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that when you mentioned it, and Alicia just said, it's definitely the aunties. And, uh, and I, I think that's so true. And I know that you said that a lot of um, um, the kind of challenges sometimes that we experience are within our own cultural groups and I think that that's just because like we said like these there's messaging that you they hear from their families growing up and then we're trying to do something that's completely different from what the status quo is right and so it comes from a place of fear and a place of anxiety about doing something different and it not working out and I actually I'll say personally I actually had one of my previous podcast guests podcast guests recommend somebody from my own community to come on the podcast and um he sent me the email and stuff and um all honesty I didn't follow up because I just was like I don't know what this person's going to say like I don't know like I wasn't sure how it was going to go and I didn't want to go there so I didn't follow up because I was afraid of that you know I was afraid of that um conversation as well but it's so interesting that within uh within my own community I felt not supported um, and what I wanted to do but yeah yeah Alicia have you obviously had these experiences too from the aunties I don't know if they've ever said it like to me or anything like that I'm sure they've been like what I've been notorious for like <laughs> just doing stuff out of the box like always pushing the edge on everything always um in my family at least I always like I'm the black sheep actually my sister is pretty she pushes a lot of boundaries as well um you have I know you have a marketer and then an architect um so yeah I mean we also were raised by like a really powerhouse of a woman thank god um so my mom is just like she's just this go-getter she has you know worked her way up through the bank and stuff like that retired when she was 48 so having that role model as well was huge, um, to both of us, I think. And just looking at how she maneuvered, anybody saying anything was interesting because on the other hand, she would maneuver through it really, really well, but then she'd come back to us and be like, Oh, but like, if you do this, what are people going to say? And I'm like, well, we have you to fight, you know, fight them for us. So really, um, but yeah, no, it's definitely been there. I'm sure people say stuff especially coming, I mean, I hate saying this, I'm like cringing inside, but especially being like an Indian person coming from Surrey, um, you're like automatically put in this box of like yeah. what you're probably going to end up achieving, doesn't have the bad or best rep, 
ever. Um, so being able to also like break out of that and being like, Hey, actually, no, like we're not all like that sort of thing has been kind of challenging as well. Like I always hesitate telling people, you know, like I went to school in Surrey and that's where, you know, my parents are and stuff. It's like, oh my gosh, but you know, <laughs> just you roll with it. Yeah. Yeah. Gabby, you, you're, <laughs> you're yeah. I'm just yeah. hearing all of your stories and I can relate to each and every one of you. Like Angisa with like, you know, the immigrant story, you know, uh, the hope being resilient and just like leaving, you know, your, you know, your home countries and then living up to a standard because of everything that was left behind. And now you have to make up for that sacrifice that was made yeah. from not whether it was your family or, you know, that sacrifice that it was uh, put in from your family that is still back home. Because uh, in my case, my mom was the first one to have left um, her home country, right? Um, and so she was very brave. She did that on her own. And, you know, to raise, uh, I'm the second youngest of seven siblings. And so she raised a big family all on her own, right? So um, in short, though, and then also, Rachel, I come from a conservative Christian family. So I can totally relate with everything that you were saying, you know, being worldly and what's right and what's wrong. So not only was there, you know, um, coming from, you know, being an immigrant, a family, a single mom who immigrated to a new country where honestly she didn't know anyone other than just like, um, I think it was like a distant friend that she, she had been connected with and had sent her a postcard of Canada. And then she's like, yep, that's where I'm going. And <laughs> she did it. She did it all on her own. And, and so, you know, here we are now and, and then just the community, the church community. So that was the whole other thing, right? So already so many layers, so many labels, right? So many different hoops that I, ha I had to jump through. And Alicia, as you said, I'm the black sheep of my family, the black sheep of everything. I mean, I'm wearing a black shirt, <laughs> but you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm just the black sheep all the time. Like, you know, I've noted as the rebel. And so, you know, I, I feel like since I was a kid, I've, I've had to always, you know, um, I've, I've kind of become comfortable in, in doing things differently. And so, which is why I, when I joined this whole entrepreneur community, I felt comfortable in that sense, because it was all about taking risks, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone. I'm like, okay, this seems familiar. I feel like this is how I've had to like survive, you know, from my childhood to adolescence. And so um, in short, it's, it's just interesting to see, even though we come from different like countries, it, I really felt that I could relate to each and every one of you like a hundred percent. And I'm sure for those who are listening, there's going to be people who are going to take, you know, bits and pieces and be like, oh yes, I can relate to this and that. But like, I feel like they're, they're different stories, but in the end we could like relate one way or another. Yeah, for sure. I always feel that um, it doesn't really matter where you're from, but I feel like all, a lot of our cultures around the world um, and the things, they're so similar and our experiences are so similar. And like many of you mentioned, it comes from a place of survival almost and fear. You know, how am I going to survive? How am I going to try to make the best out of this opportunity? And what, where, where could I go that kind of ruffles the least amount of feathers and, you know, just kind of keeps me safe you know like like Rachel you said you know nursing being a nurse or in the military it's kind of like a safe you know you job and um, being a lawyer a doctor and I think that's why those professions kind of come into the picture and um and I love and I love that you said that your mom came here all on her own because um and also uh Alicia you alluded to this too um that I was actually having this conversation with my mother-in-law because um my brother-in-law wants to move to Victoria, BC to study and she's struggling with it. She's such a, she cries about it at least weekly. And I said to her, I said, you went like all by yourself. You left Fiji to move across the world to Canada at 22 years old. Like you didn't even look back. Like you were the only one. And she's like, well, I got married and I didn't have a choice. And I said, well, he wants to study. So he doesn't have a choice because the program he wants is in Victoria. And she couldn't wrap her mind around that. And I think, again, that comes from a place of fear, right? When you, when you want to do it, you're okay with it. 
but when you want your child to do it, it's harder. And um, this isn't as related to being, you know, um, the experience that we talked about, but for me, I related to like, I'm scared of dogs. Like I will not, I will jump on a car before I let a dog walk past me. <laughs> like I'm so scared of dogs, but my daughter keeps wanting to like, we go for walks. She wants to run to every dog. And I'm like, Kate, hey, what do I do? Do I like let her run? And I can't run after her if this dog like attacks her because I won't go near the dog. Or do I just keep her far from the dog and kind of not allow her to have that kind of relationship with the pet that I didn't have? Um, and so I kind of always have that challenge. And I remember, and I thought about that recently because my mom, she, she's scared of dogs, right? So we never had a dog growing up. We were always told to stay away from dogs. They're scary. They'll attack you. They'll eat you, whatever. And I realized that I have this fear now because of all this stuff my mom told me. And now I am like, okay, I don't want to perpetuate that into my daughter, right? And that's similar to kind of the messaging that we're talking about here is that there's fears that are that transcend generations and messaging that kind of transcends generations. And unless we take a conscious effort to, to stop that or to change that message, um, it's difficult. So what, um, in all the experiences that you've had, what is the piece of advice you would give to someone that is just starting to navigate this or even... Um, you know, it was just trying to has tried to navigate this over several years without luck. What are some things that you would you would actually recommend uh, people to just just try doing as a woman of color in 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 those experiences? I would really love to piggyback what you said because the fear to you, from what I gathered, was taught, and you don't want to continue yeah. to teach that fear to your daughter. Um, my experience being so my business, it's very much my culture. So Waipaha is a Hawaiian word for good nature. I sell tropical and coastal goods. That's from the Philippines, San Diego, where I was raised, Philippines, where my parents were born, and Hawaii and Philippines, where my grandparents were born. So it's ingrained in everything I do. And I've had people, fellow Filipinos, who've gone with me to different markets or who've maybe like been with me somewhere and they've said, oh, they're not buying from you because they're white. And I go, well, that's reverse racism because maybe I'm just not their style. Like, so I think that in their mind, they're seeing things defensely when it wasn't even something. And that's because they were taught that way. Yeah. And um, so being a woman of color, I think going into an industry and trying not to set boundaries for your own success or your own goals. Like try not to think, oh, I'm not good enough because I'm a woman. I've experienced a lot more issues with being a woman in the business industry or in any industry I've worked in rather than being a woman of color. Mm -hmm. um, basically what we talked about before is, and what we've talked about now is most of the time, any of the animosity or the negativity that I received have been from my fellow Filipinos rather than anyone else of like Caucasian, Black, Hispanic, anyone else. I've never really experienced anything. And it could be because I never paid attention to it. I, they could have not liked me, but I probably justified it with a different reason. Mm -hmm. So I think me being in the same scenario with another Filipino or Asian and us just seeing scenarios differently gave us a different ceiling of success. So for them, they're like, oh, I can't keep going there because I'm colored and they won't accept me. Whereas me, I go, I need to rebrand my stuff to get that customer that I wanted. So I think just not giving in to what was taught to us or um, yeah. maybe our experiences from before because we could always find a bad seed in any culture, any religion, um, any gender. I think not setting boundaries or setting um, those, is it glass ceiling? Is that the correct term? The glass ceiling for yourself yeah. really helps you work more efficiently and stop wasting time just overthinking things that aren't even something for anybody else, if that makes sense. Yeah. Your story was a perfect setup for that, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's so true. You know, uh, the perspective, the, the perspective and the mindset that you have in, you know, that situation um, 
and, you know, not limiting yourself by saying that they don't like me because, you know, that person's white and they're not going to buy from me because I'm a colored person, but instead thinking from like a, what do I need to do in terms of my branding? Because that may have been a customer, but maybe my style wasn't there for them right now, or my branding's not there for them right now. So what, how can I adjust that? And I think that that that's very powerful because as soon as you're able to stop having that mindset that's taught to us, like you said, there's a lot of opportunities that open up for you as well. And deciding who to chase. If there's not your customer, it's not your customer. Don't spend time on them. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I would say to be uh, yourself. You know, one of the things that I always, um, or one of the things that I'm trying to advocate on the Charlas is just how our, com our culture doesn't define our personality because there are so many stereotypes even within our own community. Like I'm a perfect example, not every Latina can dance. I can't dance, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we don't all wear a tight red dress when we go out, you know? It's not <laughs> all about our curves. And, and, you know, or we're very sexualized, you know, the reality in our community. And in, if there's so many things that I could say about our community. I'm not speaking poorly about it, but there's definitely a, a lot of things, labels that need to be broken within. And because of that, I always I try to advocate, you know, just be yourself. We don't, first of all, let, you know, we can't, there's not one box fits all, right? We don't all look a certain way. We don't all act a certain way. And that's, I think, one of the first layers, layers that we have to remove within our community. So beyond that, it's like, okay, now find your space. Who's your community? Are you in the STEM community? Are you a, in the medical field? Like, well, which is kind of similar, but, you know, a creative. Um, like, what is your area? And then make a space for yourself within that field of study as well, right? So it's just like, working backwards, but I always say it all starts from, from within. So feeling comfortable mm -hmm. in your own skin, feeling comfortable in who you are, what you want to achieve. And from then on, just create your own pathway, whether that means you're joining a collective group or you're the one who's starting that, that group. Right. So just to be unafraid and, and just step you again, taking those risks to take you wherever you need to be and where you want to be really. Cause in the end, it's all about what we want to achieve. And cause there's so many mixed messages, right. In, in the end, like everyone, and it could come up, can come from a place of good, um, of a good place, a good heart, good intentions. But in the end, we have to decide what's best for us. I'm another perfect example. Um, I'm single. I don't have any kids. I'm not married, nothing. It's a whole nother uh, label within my community. I am close to being 30 and it's like, God forbid, you are not married. You, I'm not even in a relationship. I have no children. Like what's going on? Like there is something wrong with me. And there's, again, there's so many <laughs> labels and stereotypes. And so it's, it's kind of like, I feel like my community worries more for me than I worry about <laughs> my own self in terms of being in a relationship or not. But <laughs> it's like, Hey, if you know someone, sure. You know, like, you know, no, I'm just kidding. But for the most <laughs> part, it's like, it's like, you know, I think um, there's just so many things that are changing within our community with the new generation. And yeah. so, uh, first and foremost, I'd just say be comfortable in your own skin and build from that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's awesome. I think that you're, you know, you're right. Just be comfortable in your own skin. And, and, um, and I love what you say about just like the stereotypes that your own culture has for you and kind of like, you know, like you said, like almost being 30 and not being on the trajectory to get married and have kids, which, you know, is traditional, but it's not, you know, what is right for all of us, right? You know, we all have that happen at different times of our life. And I know my sister is similar. She's 30 now, but she was actually supposed to get married in September and she had to obviously COVID. So she had to postpone her wedding and her wedding was in Greece. So nobody's going to Greece in September, right? So um, when she called my grandparents to tell them, <laughs> my grandpa said, oh, is he going to wait for you for another year? <laughs> and, you know, like you're 30 and, you know, and you're going to be 31 next year. And like my sister and like my grandpa, obviously like, 
he was like the sweetest kindest person but like that was a real concern for him and it's because of that like you said that perpetuation of like you're getting to that age like what's wrong with you like you know and you know it's always about kids like oh you're gonna be 31 are you gonna be able to have kids and all this right and um yeah and my sister had to navigate that also and um and yeah and I think that that's so true that like you just need to do what you want to do you just need to be yourself and you can persevere and you can do anything that you want to do for yourself yeah yeah Alicia what um advice would you give to someone trying to navigate that that experience or those challenges as they're as they're trying to go through their career Yeah. So, um, Gabby, hello, over 30, no kids. Yeah. Um, obviously my parents are great and they understand that they're totally cool with it. They loved my dog. Um, they were fine with having him, but, um, I agree with both of them is just being yourself and like finding the right community and jumping in and getting ready to just like F shit up. Cause that's exactly what you're going to do being who you are and what you bring to the table. That's exactly what you have to be prepared to do and what you have to take the risk to do, um, especially I think in our generation, because we are not only dealing with this trauma from like our parents, you know, coming here as immigrants, we're carrying that, but we're now also maneuvering it. So the people after us don't have to deal with that. And so there's all this stuff going on in between. So how do we now change what like the status quo is while also, you know, teaching, I guess, learning and also teaching the next generation you know, hey, this is okay to do, or this is, you know, you don't have to follow this linear path. It can look like this weird, like tree of like, hey, I was going to do this, but now I'm going to do this. And I want to, you know, have kids when I'm 15 or whatever your thing is. Okay. Like it's okay. Um, no, I, I don't know. Oh my God. I'm not telling you to have kids when you're 15. Oh my God. That came out so bad. Um, but like, just, oh no. <laughs> Oh my gosh, some parent somewhere is going to get so mad at me right now. <laughs> okay, don't have kids when you're 15, stay in school. But like, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but like, do what you want to and be comfortable doing that. And like being okay, bringing those things to the table. So as Gabby was saying, you know, being comfortable in who you are and knowing who you are as well. So there was such a long time where I was like, I don't know if I, because I was surrounded by people who just didn't look like me, I was like, okay, how do I fit into this now? How do I transform myself into, you know, being part of this group that seems to have it all together and this is what their life looks like. And yeah, I would love to hit like multiple six and seven figures and all that other stuff. So I was trying to fit into that and I almost got further and further away from it because that pulled me away from my purpose, which was to disrupt the marketing industry. And I wasn't going to disrupt it fitting into that box of who those people were. So I was like, hold on, something isn't right here. I have to come back to myself. And I think that's almost like where my business completely suffered, which was like, I think last early last summer or so I was like, okay, let's rewind. Let's figure out what are you doing here? What's your purpose? What's your why? And then lead with that. And I think it all comes down to, once again, being true to who you are and like what you believe in and what your values are and not having kids when you're 15 guys. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would just say, jump in, jump in. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to shit the bed. We all do. But um, the good thing about that is you learn from it. You learn from it and you get to teach others, you know, Hey, maybe don't do this. It's kind of like, putting the hand on the stove sort of thing, you know, like somebody's done it before us and we've seen what's happened to them. We probably don't want to do it. I know there's people who still do it out there. Um, but um, yeah, be able to yeah. be, be open to learning, I guess. I yeah. Love that. I, sorry, I'm still laughing about Alicia calling herself out about 50. <laughs> I didn't catch it. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's like, it's cool. It's cool. And it's different. I didn't want to have kids until I didn't expect to get married until I was 35. Um, I got, I dated my husband and we got engaged within four months. So it was just really fast. My family knows me and they're like, I can't believe you have kids. Um, so things are just different because <laughs> 
they never expected me to have kids at such, it wasn't a young age, I'm over 30. Um, but I wanted to jump on and talk about what Gabby said about like Latinas being centralized and everything. I remember going to my first meeting at, I won't say it just in case, <laughs> but my first meeting at work, this one job I had, and this one Caucasian girl who is now one of my closest friends, like we know each other's families, everything. She went up to me the first day of work and she found out that I was Filipino. And her first remark was, oh my God, this is in LA, by the way. <laughs> um, she went up to me and she said, oh my gosh, you're Filipino? And I go, yeah. And I thought she was going to say something. And she goes, have you heard of that? I, I hope this is okay for me to say this here. She goes, have you heard of that porno? Stop me if I'm not okay saying this. She goes, have you heard of that porno called Filipinos full of penis? And I go, no, I haven't. And then she's like, oh, but isn't it such a good play on words? And I could have gotten so offended by that because here's this Caucasian girl coming up to me and saying that. Come to find out her boyfriend was Filipino. Like I didn't know this until months later. Her boyfriend was Filipino and they used to watch that together. So that's why she, I don't know why she got excited to tell me that, but she became, she's super like sweet and funny. And just, I think going into the, like what I said earlier, being so, I'm so hard to offend. Like maybe I'm just oblivious or just a little airheaded <laughs> about some things. But if you want to offend me, you have to sit me down and say, Rachel, you, you suck. Like it's hard to offend me. I won't catch I won't catch it. I'll be like, oh, was that offense? <laughs> like, I don't know if they were offending me or not. So I think missing out, she's one of my biggest supporters for my business too, to this day. She'll buy anything I post. So missing out on those opportunities of friendship and growth because I might have saw it as color, like, oh, she's racist against me, not knowing and not even being opening to learning that she also had a Filipino boyfriend. Mm -hmm. um, I think that notion of breaking the stereotype and trying not to fit into the mold and just be yourself and don't lean on what um, other people say or like all of the offensive stuff that some people can, because people can be offensive. And most of the time, sometimes they're just, that's just their awkward way of making conversation, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. I don't know if that's helpful or if that's just a story. Maybe I just wanted to tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that that's totally helpful. I think that, that explains what you like what you said, like you just, you know, you don't want to shut down relationships just because you think someone's maybe being offensive towards you, right? Um, or being racist towards you. Um, <laughs> Alicia's just making me laugh. <laughs> it is a good play on words. I'll oh give it to my that. gosh. <laughs> I was like, are you like the poster child for this movie? Like what's happening? Right now? <laughs> <laughs> late night podcast recording leads to this guys <laughs> yeah I actually I'll say that if you're listening to this on audio you need to tune into the video on YouTube because these expressions are hilarious <laughs> um but yeah no I think that that's totally so true that you can be um you can get offended and um and miss out on some opportunities and I actually you know I actually have a friend that reminded me of she gets she calls people out when they're being like blatantly like either racist or they're just being ignorant or just not knowing she'll call them out and um and obviously like we laugh at it because I'm like I can't believe you just did that and she keeps going no I have to call it out because they need to know and she does it in such a funny like blank way that like you take it as a joke but she's being serious you know and we went bowling actually like it's a mom group that I'm part of and we went bowling and it was just her and I and one other person and we were all we're all um South Asian and so she there was and everybody else is Caucasian and I guess there was only one name on there that sounded very um uh, Indian and she said oh are you so and so and she said are you are you saying that I'm so and so because I look the most Indian here <laughs> you know and she just like called them like in front of uh, the whole group said that and we all just kind of looked at each other like oh my gosh she just went there and uh and yeah and then after we left she's like yeah I can't believe she did that I don't want to you know come out to another event that she's there I felt so offended and you know and then now I know that person and I'm like that person is awesome you know she's so nice and she obviously just made a mistake with just trying to figure out who's who and um 
and yeah, it's a missed opportunity sometimes, missed learnings to just um, learn more about each other and, and give each other some grace, I think, um, is, is what you're trying to say. And I think that's great. Um, and I, I do want to talk a bit about, you know, what, what are some awesome things about being a woman of color and your ethnicity and some things that you actually truly love and enjoy. Um, and I'll kick it off by saying that I know when I was um, younger or like, I guess like a teenager, I, my mom always, my mom actually always said to me, don't ever marry another Afghan man. Don't marry an Afghan man. Like, don't do it. Like, it's not going to work out. It's just don't do it. Cause you know, obviously she's talking about her fears and my dad and whatever. So that was just always perpetuated to me. And I remember seeing people that were married you know, to another Afghan and they had, you know, we all have these kinds of little inside jokes that only make sense to someone else from the same culture as us. Right. So I remember this couple, they were always making these inside jokes with each other. And I thought to myself, I was like, Oh, that's so cute. Like I want those kinds of inside jokes. And for a brief period of time, I wanted to marry an Afghan. And obviously my mom was right. That was never going to work out because my, the way I think was never going to work out. And uh, so I met my husband, who's from a different culture. He's Fijian. I mean, we're very similar. Like we're all we're all influenced by India. We were all part of India once back in the day, uh, before we split apart. And, um, and there's a lot of cultural influences there. But he, um, when we first got married, I said to him, "I'm like, you know, I don't know if we're gonna ever have any inside jokes, and I'm a little sad about it. But but it's okay because I I love you, and we'll figure it out. But now." But then what happened is actually I didn't know this. I was with my mom and he was in the room and I said something in our language, but it, it basically meant like he's a crazy man, right? But he knew exactly what I meant. He knew the notion that I meant it in. And he got the inside joke. And so that was the first time that I realized that there there are opportunities that we can have to have inside jokes with each other from our cultures. We just have to find it and explore it. Now we have so many. Um so for me, I just feel like that's the best part of my ethnicity and being a woman of color. I feel like there's just so much like richness and so much fullness and so many experiences that um, that I've experienced both in my culture and in my husband's culture. Um, that's just so interesting. And, um, you know, and I think that I think those are the things that I really love. And I know back in the day, I wanted to change my name to Angela because nobody could say my name. And everybody was like, you know, my name is actually not even Angeza, it's Angeza, but I changed it to Angeza because that makes a lot, that's easier for people to say. So I just go with Angeza now, but um, <laughs> I know, right? But um, but then um, when as I got older, people used to say that, oh, like I'd say my name and they'd say, oh, that's such a beautiful name and all that. And, um, and you know, growing up and I started to like slowly start to love my name and I slowly started to appreciate it for what it was and uh, now I just love saying my name and you know when it came to naming my daughter uh, my husband and I were balancing the what's easy to say you know and what's more challenging to say and we all hear about you know how on resumes if your name is too challenging or too difficult you don't get the call because people don't want to butcher your name so we were, we were we obviously had to think about all these things and then we went with something that you know is we I thought easier but still being butchered so um but yeah it's just like I wanted her to have like a bit of like an ethnic name or a bit of a un, like uncommonish name and um and have that experience to just truly love her herself and who she is and her name and um and I think that that now that I'm older I so appreciate my name and um and I think that that's the yeah for me that's the best part of of being a woman of color and ethnicity is just being able to see the brighter things in life and enjoying the cultures, the richness, um, and just being part of this beautiful community um, of women that are really making our voices heard. I think it's awesome. Yeah. So what are some things that you love about being a woman of color and your within your culture? Um, and just, you know, the changes that you've seen kind of over time in yourself, especially. May you say your, how we're supposed to say your name again, though? It sounds really I, pretty. Angeza. Angeza? Yeah. Okay. Everyone yeah. on the podcast, listen up. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you correctly say your name. I love that Alicia's like, no, no, no. Alicia is your advocate to be yourself. Like sometimes I go, no, what if I do this? She's like, no, this is what you're going to do. I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. She goes, yeah, well, that's what you're going to do. 
So yeah, and that goes back to like that girl calling out um, racism is we need more people to be doing that because if we're not doing that, then it's going to continue happening. Yeah. And like, yeah. that's the last thing that I would want for, you know, like any of my friends, kids and stuff like that to go through. Cause we've gone through it. I'm sure everybody here sitting on the podcast has been at some point been like, Oh, like that wasn't really cool, but like, I don't really want to say anything now. I'm like, Hey, like actually that's really shitty to say, don't say it about this person or don't say it about me or, you know, um, so we need to call out racism. It's, yeah. it's very much well and alive and being women of color on this podcast. I also do want to voice that because we, if other people aren't going to stand up for it, there has to be leaders in the community and the four of us who are leaders and, you know, our different industries and our communities, we should be leading the way when it comes to calling people out or being like, Hey, that's actually not how you say my name, or that's not how you pronounce this or what you said about that, you know, stereotype of so-and-so is not cool. It's not okay, actually. Um, so yeah, also just bring that to light. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think definitely bringing it up and um, acknowledging it and, and, you know, calling it for what it is, is so true. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's so true. Yeah. No, I completely agree with you there. And uh, you're making me accountable, right? Calling it out, which I, I feel it's like something that I've kind of lacked in and I'm, I'm trying to work on as well, being that spoke person and advocating whether it's for myself or others in, in using my voice. Um, but in regards to being a woman of color in my community, uh, one thing that I love is just uh, the diversity, right? Um, I, I really love the richness and beyond that, just the resiliency um, that there is in, in being hardworking with, with our community, um, you know, um, despite of where we've come from and immigrating to a new country, you hear at the same time, a lot of success stories, right? And, and I think it was Alicia who mentioned the trauma that we're, our parents are leaving behind, which is, I feel something that needs to be spoken of more too. Um, but anyways, <laughs> that, that's a whole nother conversation because in some form, like you mentioned it, we're, we're letting go of that, right? We're breaking all of those, um, that lineage, all of those things that have, you know, held us back, right? We're saying, you know what, we're the new generation. Um, we have a voice, we have a space. Um, this is our story. And it's, it's really, again, going back to owning who you are, owning your story and just, um, I'm also an opportunist. So I feel that there's also a lot of opportunity because a lot of that representation is still needed. So I almost feel like it's very exciting because it's, there's, it's a time where there's a lot of change that's happening globally, but it's also a time where it's creating an opportunity for the, for us to step up and really share our stories for us to be heard. And it's almost like people are listening, right? Cause there's so much happening all, you know, in, for example, in our, with, in our, uh, neighbor country, right? With, you know, Trump and, and everything and just a lot of, you know, discrimination, a lot of racism. And, and that's not to say that there isn't any racism here in Canada as well, right? I just picked someone who is very blatant and very obvious about it, right? But I feel that in situations like that, they're happening here. Actually, um, someone posted on Instagram this past weekend, they were having a Trump rally at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Okay, <laughs> talking about the COVID, the masks and everything. So that's what I'm saying. It's not that like, it's not close to home because it isn't. And it, racism can even happen within our own community as well with, you know, whether you're light-skinned, whether you're not, where do you come from? Are you from the North of the country? Are you from the, cent from the, you know, the South? Like, where are you from? Like, and so there's just so much that needs to, that's slowly changing. I feel globally, culturally, and even a lot of like personal growth, but overall, yeah. I, I always like to turn things around and say the same things that are, that we are saying that need to change is also an opportunity for us to step up. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. What, you know, the kind of messaging that's, that's done, um, you know, by, by the president in, of the United States, it's, you know, it definitely transcends, right? There's like one aspect of it that like, we probably hear about those, 
you know, and there's avenues now to voice those kind of like perspectives now. And that's more easily able to go viral, if you say, but it definitely transcends. And um, actually, just before COVID in January, I was walking through one of the big malls and I walked out and I was walking in front of this car that had stopped, obviously, to let me cross. And I looked and the, the license plate was a Confederate flag. And in an instant, my heart dropped and I was like, I was fearful I, for my safety. I was like, I don't know what's going on right now, but this is so weird that I see this flag, like just right up front, like, you know, and for a second I did, like, I was truly concerned for my safety. Like, should I really be walking in front of this car? Like what's going to happen? Like, I was really scared, but it definitely transcends. And I think that you're right, that this is an opportunity to, you know, have our voices heard and my husband actually he watches a lot of comedy and he sent me this comedy skit and I'll have to find out the name and send it to you guys but um there's this one comedian and he was doing this show and in front of him there was you know a Caucasian man oh no no he said it was actually um I think it was actually an African-American man that had a hat that said you know make America great again right and then he was with with his wife who was Caucasian and she was pregnant and then he stopped his skit in the middle after he saw this person he stopped his skit in the middle and he said he looked over to the table next next to them and it, it was obviously an Indian family and he turned around he's like one of you must be a doctor and you know the daughter put her head and was like I'm a doctor right and then turned to that man and said what if your wife went into labor right now an immigrant is going to deliver your son or daughter. How do you feel about that? And, you know, if we want to make America great again, we have to, you know, embrace the cultural diversity we have. We have to embrace everybody that's here. We're not, we shouldn't be perpetuating these division, divisive kind of comments and messages. And um, yeah, and I thought that was like, just the fact that he stopped it in the middle of his show and he called that out, I thought that was, that was pretty strong, a pretty strong message. And um, yeah, and I think that, that, yeah, definitely what you said definitely transcends. And now is an opportunity to speak up and to share our voices and to, to be a part of the collective, for sure. I think something- Okay, I'm else... gonna share my favorite thing. Oh, go for it, Rachel. No, no, go ahead. No, now you have to go. <laughs> I was going to um, quote a previous conversation we've had anyway, so it's about you anyways. So Alicia and I were talking before when everything happened because we had a team meeting um, for business babes on how we were going to proceed in each of our cities because all of our cities are different. All of our communities are different. Um, we've built different relationships with different people in each of our communities. So one thing that we all agreed on, and Alicia was the one who um, ignited this conversation, was we just really need to be great connectors within being women of color because all of us have the space where we I know where I stand I have pockets of people that I know and colleagues who are all white or pockets of colleagues who are all black and that's their own circles and that's and all like Asians all Latinas those are the own circles and they're nurturing their own communities that's what they want to do but just taking the leaders from each group and connecting them to each other so they have those resources. I think that's something that we can really do to yeah. create those conversations and kind of just make a more diverse, like a melting pot within our local communities. And yeah. that's what we are trying to do with Business Babes Collective too. And that's how we are trying to move forward. And we all met through that. So just really being cognizant that if we have a friend who is, Caucasian and all of her friends are Caucasian. It doesn't mean that she's not open. It's just where they are, their neighborhood, the what they do. That's probably who they have access to. And same with anyone else. Because I know I went to a school of 3,000 people, but I'm from Southeast San Diego. That's where I was born and raised. 90, like 90% 90 are all colored. Probably about 60% are Filipino. And it came to the point where they tried to bus Caucasians from Northern San Diego to us to diversify our school. And it was reverse racism at that time. Not reverse, it was racist where I know some people are like, oh, look, at, like you could point out the white people at our school. And it's like all brunette heads and there's like one red head. And then they ended up not doing that because people weren't befriending them. Like, I feel really bad. I wasn't befriending them either. I just, we're just not, we didn't know a different culture back then. So just being 
aware of what we did when we were younger because I know that I wasn't as welcoming because I had no idea <laughs> like this is gonna sound so ignorant now I had no idea how to talk to a white person I wasn't around them like and from what I've been told they didn't like me so um I think that is what I grew up with until I moved to LA and here in San Diego all of my aunties and everything and people who came back I'm uncomfortable saying aunties now since we agreed that it's aunties who tell us these things coming back from the Philippines they gave me papaya soap or escanol, which is skin widening creams. No, thank you, Bobby. So, so mm -hmm. I'm really dark and my hair is super frizzy, which is not the beauty norm of Filipinos. The native Filipinos in the mountain, yeah, but not like the Filipinos you see on TV. The Filipinos are winning the beauty pageants. They're not, they don't look like me. I'm not that type of Filipino. So I always tried to hide that growing up. I tried to use all the whitening creams. I tried to, not because of my parents, but because my aunties, my cousins, everyone was like light skinned and beautiful mm -hmm. and straight hair. I put mayonnaise in my hair every night to make it not, it just ended up looking like oily and wet the next day. <laughs> Instead of, it was so like just frizzy, oily, wet. But I really tried. And I remember, no, oh, thank you, puppies. I remember going to LA where there's so many Caucasian people and them saying, oh my gosh, I love your tan. I'm like, what tan and they're like oh my gosh how did you get that perm in your hair I was like what perm like I had no idea how to appreciate those things until a different culture taught me how to do it because my own culture was telling me that wasn't acceptable like I wasn't fitting within the mold so um I don't know that's pretty much I don't know what point I was making <laughs> with I had two different stories yeah. well, my son locked himself out but that's pretty much um what I wanted to share yeah. Yeah. Do you want to share, Alicia? Yeah, I'm just like sitting here. I'm like, why would you not want to be open to like other cultures? Like, I think that's like one of my favorite things about meeting people and like hearing their stories and the different backgrounds that they have and the different experiences and stuff. I'm like, why would you not want to open yourself up to this? Because it's so cool. Um, and yeah, I mean, diversifying just people around you and being that connector and um, creating those opportunities for people around you. So like once you are on a podcast, you know, sending other women of color their way, being like, hey, here's like some really great women that I would love for you to interview because this is what they're doing and they're probably going to be a good fit. Like creating those, those types of stepping stools, you know, and um, connections between each other is just so important. Um, yeah. Yeah. My favorite thing about my culture is I'm also Fijian. So there's like a oh. sense of community. Yeah. My parents were born and raised there. Um, there's just like a really strong sense of community because the population is so small. Like you, yeah. the island is so small. You can drive around in like 10 hours of mm -hmm. the entire island. Um, so we, like, I grew up there going, um, going there every summer for like a month. And yeah, there's just a strong sense of community and um, every night, like people from the different villages would come and like play cards at night or like share a meal and stuff like that. And I'm like, plus, have you seen our weddings? Like what? Cause obviously <laughs> there's Indian descent there who doesn't want to party for like five days. So yeah, no, I think there's so many things to appreciate, <laughs> appreciate about our different cultures. But, yeah, no, I think there's just so many cool things. And Gabby was talking about hers and, you know, Rachel as well. And there's so many things to appreciate not only about our culture, but like other ones as well. Yeah. And it's so important that we're open about that. And I think that's one thing I love about um, meeting other immigrants or, you know, first gen and all that is we have this like sense of openness. So when we're even communicating with each other, if we say a sen sentence wrong or, you know, somebody's um, English is like their second language or something, we open our mind to be like, oh, hey, like this is probably what they meant instead of sitting there being like, I didn't understand. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's also ignorance, but yeah, no, <laughs> I think there's just like so much more like an openness that we're involved with. And yeah, I, I just appreciate all of you guys. And I'm excited. Yeah. Thank yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's amazing. And that's a great way to, to wrap up the conversation. I've you know, I've had so much fun and I loved all the perspectives that you brought on. And um, the, when actually, I don't know if 
I, I don't know if I share this, but Lily Singh is like my, like, I love her. She, I love how real she is. And she, one of the things that when she first got her talk show, she posted this like before and after like 10 years ago and now, and the now was like her like front cover of the magazine she was on announcing her um, being the first woman of color, having a talk show, a late night talk show. And the first one was like her very first YouTube video. And she said, she's like, when I first started, there were people that were saying, um, you know, all these things about like, what are you doing? You're never going to make it. You're a joke. And she's like, those people were making fun of me. They were giving me a hard time. They were talking, they're spreading rumors about me and whatnot. She's like, well, now that I'm here, she's like, now those same people are starting to message me telling me how proud they are of me and how they want to do this for themselves. And she's like, and they've started their own YouTube channels or, you know, something of, of the source. And she's like, you know, you're going to have those people that are doubting you. And it's just because they want to do what you're doing and they're just scared to do it. They haven't moved past that fear yet. So you just keep doing what you do because that'll continue to push them and inspire them to do what they want to actually do and to overcome that fear. And eventually you'll get to a place where, where, um, you know, the more of you, us that are successful and supporting each other and encouraging each other, the richer and, and uh, bolder the community will be as well. Yeah. So I just, so that's how I feel with, with all of you and just watching your, you know, your um, businesses grow and all the impact that you're making in the world. It's just so encouraging and so inspiring. Definitely for me, uh, being a newer entrepreneur and trying to trying to grow and uh, build as well. I definitely have really appreciated watching all of you. Um, yeah. Do you have any, does anyone have any final thoughts they want to share? Um, I'm really hungry now for all of your spices and all of your different <laughs> cultural foods. If I can just say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Alicia, we got to talk about the food because Fijian food is so good. I, oh my I thought gosh. they like open this food truck down in Seattle. It's like these three wow. guys. Um, and this is how small Fiji is. I was going down to Seattle and my dad was like, Oh, like, what are you going to do? And I told him that I was going to go to this Fijian food truck. And he was, he was like, wait, he's like, is this what it's called? And I was like, yeah, I was like, why do you know this? And he's like, I used to work because my dad used to work for the Fiji times, which is a newspaper out there. And he's like, I used to work with the guys who owns it. There's three guys who own it. I used to work with his dad. And he's like, I've been trying to get a hold of him for so long. Like, I don't know where to find him. And I was like, what? And so, yeah, no, 10 out of 10 would recommend Fijian food. It's bomb. Yeah. We so all need good. to like meet when COVID is over and just have like a feast. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that what you just, I wanted to just talk about what you said, like who doesn't want to have a five day wedding? Our weddings are one day <laughs> and I had a five day wedding because I wanted to, my whole family was like, what is this? Like, you know, like we did like a ceremony in the afternoon and in the evening we had to go somewhere else and you had to change your outfits. And I like, I literally had an itinerary and a folder for each of my family members. And I handed it to them. I was like, here's all the places you need to be at. Here's how you should dress at each event. <laughs> you know this is what's gonna happen and they were just like they still talk about it to this day they're like what were you thinking that was that was a lot I was like yeah but it was so fun so much fun yeah yeah um Gabby did you have any final thoughts no, I just loved all of this. I think that everyone said everything that, that was voiced. I, I just love diversity. And so I love the richness of the conversations that we had. And just, uh, Alicia, you made a solid point, uh, the, how we embrace different cultures. And that's what really is making a difference now and how we're trying to change our story, right? In, in coming together as a melting pot. And and because in the end, like, yes, um, our, our cultures are very rich and they create for an interesting story. But beyond our cultures, I feel that there are other things that we identify with outside of our, 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 our cultures as well, right? So um, I feel like that's the part of growth in being a first generation. Like there's a, a lot of the Latinos in the Hispanic community, um, a quote that uh, they use and say, I'm from over there and I'm from here. So where you merge, you know, 
your culture and where you're also uh, currently living or where you were born, right? So a lot for yeah. the uh, new immigrants or the first generations where it's like, no, it doesn't mean that I'm just gonna suddenly just forget my past and where my roots. No, because clearly it's a part of us, but we're also saying, you know what? We also belong here as well. Yeah. And yeah, also, I love that. I'd also love to add, because I know that we've all had experiences and then especially how Angeza, Angeza, Angeza? Angeza. 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 <laughs> how Angeza <laughs> and Alicia were saying, like, disrupt and break the mold and call it racism when you see it. I also believe that it's hard. It's hard when we see racism. It's hard not to feel negative towards that person who is making us feel that way or making those statements. But I think those are the people that we need to show more grace to and we need to change their mind. Like it's, I think that's part of our responsibility to educate them through our own actions and just show them whatever hurt you in the past who look like me or whatever experience you had with people who look like us we're not all like that. Like, mm -hmm. and I think having that responsibility and just praying through it or whatever our higher power, our belief system is just digging deep and really trying to break that mold. And like Alicia's motto, like disrupt, disrupts whatever negative thoughts people have about us. Um, mm. Just really leaning on each other and reaching out. Like if we experience something, we can reach out to each other and be like, how would you deal with people like this? Um, cause I'm about to break their neck right now, <laughs> trying, not to, trying to hold my temper, but I know that they need a little bit more grace, um, and a little bit more of the lights rather than any other experiences. So just really being cognizant of that, uh, moving forward. I think that would really help our next generation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think that, yeah, that's so true. And, um, yeah, and I, uh, yeah, I think that um, back to what you said just earlier, just before we wrap up, you said about um, the the notion of beauty, like what what is beautiful, it's fair skin, it's smooth hair. And I actually, just before this podcast episode, I was like, oh, I should go straighten my hair. But then I was like, what, like, what am I actually going to share in terms of like, what do I think beauty is, right? And so I was like, I'll just leave my natural waves you know, as is, and just like, just be myself and, you know, and share that. And my daughter who, um, I don't know if you guys have seen photos of her, she has like, a, she has like basically like curls all over her head. And it's just like the most wild hair that I've ever seen. And, um, and I just love it. I love every minute of it. And I don't try to like hide it or like put it away or, or anything like that. And uh, I just love the way it is. And um, and I, that really gets me thinking, like, if we just all embraced our own natural beauties, like how much more confident and much more like richer we'll be in the world if we're just all ourselves, as opposed to trying to fit into like one or two kind of like standards, right? If we just show the diversity and just show um, what we are just naturally, it's just, it really, really helps to continue to provide that representation and show younger, younger kids growing up um that you can be anything you want to be and you just have to be happy um at the end of the day with whatever you want to do yeah so I so appreciate you all joining me uh today on the podcast I that conversation was so great um I love I love the substance I love the richness the joy the funniness um all of it um and so for those of you um that want I will link um Alicia Rachel and Gabby's social media accounts and, and websites on the show notes for the podcast. So you can reach out and connect with them directly if you would like. Um, and if you have any questions for them and yes, thank you so much for joining me. That was so much fun. I hope you all had fun too. And uh, I so appreciate it. Um, yeah. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your evening. You as well. Thank you. Ladies. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.